Hey everybody, Ron Bielefeld, Whistling Wings Photography. How are you doing today? A new video for you. Today I'm going to do my post-processing workflow for bird photography. And I'm going to go through using Lightroom, Photoshop, and Topaz Denoise AI in my workflow. So if you're interested in knowing more about how I post-process my bird images, stay tuned. Okay, here we go. We're going to post-process some bird images using Lightroom, then Photoshop, Topaz Denoise, and back into Photoshop to save our final images. Going to record some actions along the way to help me and you do our bird photography post-processing much quicker, I think. So here we go. Going to transition over and get into Lightroom here. You can see we're in the library module. I've got a bunch of kingfisher images that I recently took in here and I've picked one that we're going to go ahead and process. So the first thing I do of course is go up into the develop module. Click on the develop module. Bring the image into the develop module. Once we're in here we'll go over the first thing I do is go over to the crop overlay tool and we click on that brings up a grid to help you look at your your crop I don't do any kind of proportional crops I generally do a free transform crop where I just go with what I like as far as the composition so I draw it right on there something like that some things I look at I want the tail pointing toward the corner I want this wing here toward that corner we've got this going to this corner Got a pretty nice composition there, I would say. Just hit the enter key, and that will bring you into your, your crop that you want. Now, if you go down here and you can see the image we're working on, there's an icon that's now on that image, and it says the photo has been cropped. And this icon is an active icon. You can have the icons active or non-active. I have them active. And if you click on that, allow you to go back in and modify your crop if you'd like. I think we're good here. So I'm going to hit enter again and go back to our crop and we'll keep working on our image. Now the next thing I generally do is look at the histogram up here. Uh, we have 0 down here and 255 up here when it comes to uh, luminosity. That's total black, no data, total white, no data. I look at the clipping indicators up here and I see that there's no shadow clipping because there's no uh, indicator light lit up here. Neither is there one on the white side, right side. So for the most part, I think our range, our tonal range of the image in the image is pretty good as it stands. Now we're gonna do a finer look and adjustment to this in Photoshop, but for now, I generally just look to see if there's any clipping going on and rectify that here in Lightroom because we're working with the raw data in this engine in Lightroom and that's the best time to do any kind of changes that you want to make to uh, the overall image such as luminosities, exposure if you want to call it that and then any uh, changes to those uh, areas on the bird or in the background or anything else. So now is the time to do that. So we looked up here, like I said, nothing going on there. I think we're fine. The next thing I look at is the overall temperature of the image, which is right here. I look at the image and I say, eh, is it too warm? Is it too cool? Or do I pretty much like the way it looks? For me, I think the temperature uh, at 6,050 right here it looks pretty good to me. So I think we're going to keep it that way. I generally don't do anything with tint. The next thing I will do though is look at some contrast. Here's the contrast. To me again in here the contrast looks pretty good. So I'm not going to make any changes there. Now the highlights, if we zoom in on this, there looks like we could get a little more detail out of this area here and this area here uh, on the bird. It look, they look a little bright to me. Now I'm going to throw up a caution these are white. 
whites. They're not grays. I see so many people go in and try to draw out all this detail in bright white areas or even in shadows if you want to go to the opposite end of the luminosity spectrum and make things look unrealistic. If they're white, they're white. Sometimes things are so white, not blown out, but you're not going to see feather detail there because they're very bright white. If they're meant to be white, keep them white. Don't make them gray just to get detail out of it. But here I think we could do a little work, so we're going to do that in just a minute. But I'm not going to use the highlights slider because that would change the luminosity of the entire image. All of the highlights would change, and I, I like the brightness of the overall image. Just these small areas need to be adjusted. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the masking tool and click on that. And we're going to go to the brush tool click on that. Now we've created a new mask. We're going to zoom in on this area so we know what we're working on. Control plus. So we can see a lot better what we're working on here. Now hold the space bar down so we can pan. And now we're going to take this brush which we can change the size of. I've got it on my mouse wheel. And I'm going to make the brush an appropriate size. and I'm going to paint on the area that I want to change the luminosity of there. And let's go down here. I think we'll do a little bit there. And we'll go down here. And we'll do a little bit in here. Now again, when I do post-processing, it's a light hand. No heavy-handedness. If you need a heavy hand, maybe the image isn't so great. And you should just go out and try to take a better image. So now what do we do? We do, do we do highlight to change this? Because now we're in the control of the brush. No, I'm going to use exposure. I'm not going to use highlights and I'm not going to use whites. I'm going to use exposure. And I'm going to, you can see what's going to happen. I'm just doing the, the obvious big time heavy hand in this here just to show you what's happening. But we bring that down to just where it brings out a little more detail in that area. Minus 0 0.30 looks good to me. I can see some detail in there. It's not gray. It's still whitish, matching kind of the grayish looks and whitish looks of these other areas that I think were exposed a little bit better. So that is how I deal with using this new masking tool to go into a specific part of the bird of the image itself and make some changes. Let's see, let's bump this actually up a little brighter to 0.24 and see what we've got there. I think that's even a little bit better. We're not going to get real picky here right now, but that's how that's the next thing I would do in my in my workflow to get out of the masking tool, just click on it again. Now we're back into, and then we can just click on here and get back looking at the whole image again. We're back into the uh, controls for the entire image. Anything else do I, that I want to change on here now with the brush? This is a little dark here, but you know what? Shadows and lights, let them play in your image. It adds depth and stuff. Everybody wants, it seems, so many people want their images to be perfectly lit all over, all well lit even underneath wings and things shadows and highlights and things exist in nature it's what makes things look natural leave them when they make things look natural like in this case this this fall off with the light direction in this image from brighter here to darker here perfectly natural if you light this up over here that's gonna you could bring that up you could bring those shadows up i don't want to it adds depth to the image, it adds feeling, emotion to the image. In certain cases, leave it. Don't try to bring everything up to where it's bright and you can see detail all the time. So anyway, moving on, getting off my soapbox there a little bit. Uh, so looking at the rest of this image, I think it looks pretty good. And here's another message I wanna bring along. If your images need a ton of work, maybe they're not so great. You're gonna find out that in most of my processing, if I do this again and again and again, image after image, there's not a lot to do. It's because 
I'm working with images that I did a good job on in camera, I think, and I don't need to do a lot of work with them. Those are the images I end up processing. Not that they're all like this. I'm like you. I take some overexposed images, underexposed images, a lot fewer of those now with mirrorless cameras. But anyway, if an image takes only a couple minutes to process, it's a good image because you don't have to make a lot of changes. So anyway, moving on from here, the next thing I would do is come down to the bottom. There's a lot of other things you can do, and I want to go over some of them. Uh, we may not use them on every image, but I want to kind of go where I would go next. You can come down to Transform, and sometimes, especially with birds in flight, you get off. You're not level. Here, this looks good. It looks level. It looks fine the way it is, so I'm not going to change it. But here's where you, I go to the rotate, and when you hover over the marker on the slider, it brings up a grid so that you can help align your image. If there's a horizon or a water line or something like that, you can go ahead and deal with that. And you can see what would happen here if you did. But we're going to go back to zero and leave it alone. But that would be the next thing I would look at. Really don't do anything down here with sharpening or anything like that lens calibrations and things like that. Um, you could do some work there, lens corrections. You can see I've had the enabled profile corrections in there. I shot this, it knows, Lightroom knows, I shot it with the Canon uh, 100 to 500. And so we're good. It made any corrections there and it seems to do fine. Uh, so I kind of leave it run on its own. So when it comes to this image in Lightroom itself, I think we're in pretty good shape. So now what I want to do is I want to go into um, Photoshop with this image. So what I end up doing from here is I go ahead and click and I go right click on the mouse, hit edit in, go to Photoshop. It will open the image in Photoshop and we'll move on with this image in Photoshop to finish it up. Now you'll notice I don't have any palettes in here to work with for Photoshop. That's because I use multiple monitors and I'm not going to do that here but I do have my palettes on another monitor right now and what I'm going to do is I'll drag the ones over that I need as we need them. So the first thing we'll look at is the layers palette and you can see that it brought the image in as a background layer. The first thing we want to do when we get into Photoshop with the image, unlock it, make it a regular layer. The next thing we want to do is duplicate that layer to make a copy of it. That way, as, as we go through the process, if we add layers and we mess it up, if we want to go back to the start, we can do that by getting rid of all the layers above this layer zero and we're back to where we started. So anyway, it's just one thing that we can do. The other thing we can do is have the history palette open, which I do over here. I'll bring it over here for just a second and it will record everything we do so we can always jump all the way back to open and that would bring us back to the beginning as well. So there's different ways to do things. So I'm gonna move the history palette away again so we can see more of the image and what we're gonna to do to it. So what I generally do in Photoshop these days is that finer adjustment to the white and black points, looking at that histogram like we did in Lightroom, but we're going to look at it in Photoshop now, and Photoshop allows, I think, a better, uh, more refined way of looking at the black and white points of your image, which you should do for every image, and therefore adjusting those if necessary to get the full tonal range. So the next thing I would do is add an adjustment to, I'm gonna bring these over here. I was, I'm, I'd add an adjustment layer and it's going to be a levels layer. So we add that levels layer. You can see it here now at the top layer of this uh, multi-layered uh, work that we're doing in Photoshop. And you can see it opened the properties of the adjustment levels layer here. And here's your black point slider, your white point slider, your midtones. Now, on a PC, if you hit the Alt button 
and hold down the left mouse button at the same time, you can see what it does. And let's move this over here out of the way. For the black point, it whites out the entire image except for where you might be clipping a little bit of the darks. And you can see if you slide that slider over what it does. And the goal is to get it set to where there's only a very few pixels lighting up like that when you're at zero. So that's looking pretty good. It's the eye and a couple areas of the shadows that are really dark and maybe clipped out, but that's fine. You do the same thing on the white side. You don't see any pixels lit up here. That means you haven't clipped or blown out any of the highlights. You can adjust it to, to blow them out if you want. See, now, ooh, way too bright in those areas. By moving. But we bring it back up to 255. That looks good. You bring it down a little bit more, and at 253, some pixels are starting to light up in the fish here. But we leave it at 255, and I think that's good. So what this tells you is that you've got the full tonal range possible in this image being depicted here in the image now, the way it stands. So that is the next step, is doing that levels layer and looking at the white and black point adjustments. If I look at this now and I see that there's really nothing else to do, uh, no more adjustments to be made, if I wanted to do pixel level adjustments, if I wanted to remove something from the image or add canvas to the image, I would do it here in, Light, in Photoshop, not in Lightroom. And I would do that with like the cloning tool over here. Or we could crop, the cool thing about in Photoshop, if we wanted to, we can crop outside and add canvas by going to edit and then content aware fill and then add canvas that way. We don't need to do that in this image, so I'm not going to. Um, go control Z will bring us back a step, get rid of that. And so, you can do things like that, and that's where I would do them is here in Photoshop if you wanted to clone things out or if you wanted to add canvas to an image or something like that. But this image, I think, looks good pretty much where, uh, where it is. And so here's our layers that we have. The last thing I do in Photoshop before I save this as a TIFF file is I call it Stamp Visible or Flatten all of these layers and put that flattened version of all this as another layer at the very top of these layers here. So there's a, there's a shortcut to doing this and it's Control Shift Alt E on a PC. So Control Shift Alt E and you can see that it added a layer up here, a pixel layer, the picture, and this contains all of this. And you can see, I'll bring over the history palette, and you can see the last thing that I did was stamp visible. So that's what that last process did. So we can move this over here. So from here, what I do is I save this now as a TIFF file, as my final processed version of my image that has all the layers that I did in it in a Photoshop uh, in Photoshop as a TIFF file. So we go up here to File, Save As. I'm going to save it on an external hard drive that's connected to my computer. It's under Images for Wildlife Process 2022 and it's going into Belted Kingfishers Late 2022. That's the final folder. You can see I have some already in here. And we'll go ahead I'll click on one just to get some text down here that I can work with, the juvenile female, and I'll name it uh, Landing Perch Fish Squish, something like that. Something unique that I can identify what the image is probably about when I look just at the image uh, title and hit save. So now that's what we've got is a TIFF options menu that I just leave this absolutely as default, hit OK, and now you can see it says saving 99%, it's done. So now we're done with this image as far as 
saving the TIFF file, but we're not done with the image because I want JPEG versions of this image. And so we're gonna make some changes and this is where we're gonna go and uh, make some uh, size changes and then also bring in, because we haven't done any de denoising, we haven't any done any noise removal or any sharpening of this image yet. I don't do that to my TIFF files. Those TIFF files are generally saved as a full size version of my image with as much data as there can be saved, saved so that if I wanna go back and reprocess for some reason, I can do that. The JPEGs, once you change sizes and change them to a JPEG and you lose all the data that's associated with the original file, well, if that's all you've got left to go back to at some point and reprocess, or if you wanna make it bigger or something like that, you don't have many options there anymore. So anyway, the next thing we do want to do, though, that I want to do, is make a JPEG out of this. And I generally make 3,000 pixel on the long side JPEGs to save and then to use uh, to send to people or, or whatever I'm going to use them for. So here we go. So the next step is then to... I'm going to get this layers out of the way just for now. We're going to go to Edit. <laughs> and we're going to Convert to Profile. bring that dialog box over here so you can see it because the image right now is in Profoto RGB and for things like the web you do not want it in Profoto RGB that color space or that gamut is way too wide it doesn't it's not how the the web works so we want to change it to sRGB and that's what this step does so here we go hit OK that changes it to sRGB now we want to go to image and we want to go to mode and right now you can see it's in 16 bits. We want to change that to 8 bits for a JPEG. So now it's an 8 bit. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to want to go to image. We want to go to image size. Again, I'll bring that over so you can see it. Getting a lot of notifications, which is a real pain, but that's okay. You can see that it's pretty big, but I want to reduce the size to save as a JPEG. So we go up to the width up here, and I'm gonna make it 3000. Now, that's because it's a landscape uh, image. If it was a vertical portrait type image, I would change the height to 3000 if I had 3000 pixels to work with. I have plenty of pixels to work with here on the long side to reduce it to 3000. If it was already smaller than 3000 on the long side, I don't want Photoshop to blow it up I would just keep it as its original size then and move on from here, from there, um, through the rest of the uh, post-processing. But I do want to make this smaller because it was very, uh, it was a good size image even after the crop. So I have some room to make it smaller down to the, my general setting of 3000 pixels on the long side. The resample box should be checked. You want to resample the image when you do this. By cubic sharper, that's fine for a reduction. You can go to um, by cubic smoother. There's a lot of different things in here. I generally keep it for um, my reductions in by cubic sharper. So we hit OK, and you can see, boop, it reduced the size of the image just like that. So now it's we're only looking at 33%. If you look down here in the left-hand corner of the image. We can go control plus, bring it up to 50% so that we can see what we're doing here a little bit better. And so there is our reduced size image. Now, this is when I invoke Topaz Denoise AI. If you listen to Topaz and you listen to a lot of other people, they're gonna have you sharpening your raws and things like that. I really don't know why and I don't want to get in on my soapbox again and, or get into any kind of discussion with anybody out there about when the best time to do the sharpening and denoising is. But to me, it's after your image is at the final size, you're going to use it. And so I'm just going to stop right there. The other reason I'm stopping right there is because I think when I'm done with my images, saving the JPEG versions of them, they look really, really good. I'm getting good results doing it in this order, so that's the order I do it in. Next, if we go on up here to filter, 
and we go down to Topaz Labs. These are plugins. I have Topaz set up as plugins for uh, Photoshop. And we go over to Topaz Denoise. And it's going to bring the image into Topaz Denoise. Now I've moved it over to a different monitor. So let's, if I can, bring it over here. And it, right away it brings up the image at 100%. And I have it set to clear algorithm. There's five different algorithms here that you can use, or models, however you want to uh, call it. And I really like clear AI. It really works well on 90% of the images that I do. There's some work that you can change down here. Uh, work that you can do and you can change some things down here like how much noise to remove, how much sharpness to apply, how much recovery. But these settings, I'm going to put that back on low because in general it's the low, low that works best for me. And you can see that down here it's already done that work applying this algorithm, the clear algorithm with low, low settings and recover original detail set at 50. I like 50 there. And if you hit the space bar, you, it goes to the original and then let go and it shows you what it did. And I don't know how well it comes through in this video, but it did a nice job of sharpening. I like to look at the feet, look at the scales. Not a whole lot, it looks pretty good there, but now, all that detail comes out also around the eye in the scales and eye of the fish up here in the wood all sharpened much better you can look at the noise in the background disappears a little bit there's not a whole lot of noise in this image i don't think so it didn't do a whole lot there but i like it i like what topaz denoise does denoise denoises and sharpens so I usually just run it through Denoise. I don't run it through um, Topaz Sharpen or anything like that most of the time, my images. Another way you can look at it is bring up the, the little slider bar here and that's before and that's after. So you can do that and you can see, look at the eye of the fish as we go by, boom. Look at the eye of the bird, the little white flecks down underneath its eye there, boom. Look at its feet, boom. Much more detail there. Topaz does an excellent, excellent job. So I really like the results here. They're not over sharpened. It's, it's sharp, it brought out the detail. It looks natural. Water drops look natural. Hit apply. It's gonna process up here and apply it to the image in Photoshop. So there it is. We can go ahead and go into 100% and to me that looks really, really nice. So we'll back back out of there and from here I save it as a JPEG. File, save as, it's going into the same location on my external hard drive. I'm going to change the name though to 3000 at the end because that tells me what the longest side of the image is in pixels. And I'm going to change the TIFF. Oop, can't do it that way. Have to save as copy. Okay, and then go to JPEG. So now it's going to be that name down here with the 3000. It's going to be a JPEG. And we hit save. Now, after we hit save, it gives you some options, some JPEG options. And quality 12, it tells you the size. If you click the preview box, five megapixels, that's what I want. Hit OK. Now it saved the JPEG. We can go in, close all. No, we don't want to save any changes to the TIFF file. And then file, open, we can see what we just did in here. Opens that file folder there and if we can find it in here somewhere <laughs> there it is right there there's the tiff version tiff file 
and here's the 3000 on the long side file, the JPEG file. So that's the workflow right there. That is my workflow. It doesn't take but a few minutes to do each image. And I have action set up to do the TIFF part of it and then move on to the JPEG part of it so that I have to do a lot less clicking and it takes even less time to deal with processing my images. So that's the next thing we're going to do in this video is I'm going to show you how to record those actions. Now, I'm not going to go through all the explanations again like I just did in processing another image. I'm just going to show you how to record the action and then you can go ahead and record actions however you want to record them for your workflow so that you can make uh, your post-processing that much more efficient. So we'll be right back. Okay, on to creating some actions. Actions, what are actions? Actions are just recordings of the steps that you perform in Photoshop, doing whatever you're doing. In this case, we're uh, you know, working on some post-processing of bird images. So anything that you do over and over again for every image, good candidate for creating an action because you can do all of those steps then by basically just clicking one or two two things and it does a lot of it automatically so it speeds things up really really well for you and so that's what we're going to end up doing so if we go over into Photoshop again and I bring the action palette over here I've got another kingfisher image I'm working on this is where the bird just came out of the water a lot of water uh, droplets there but I've done everything that I normally do to the image in Lightroom and now we're back into Photoshop kind of following the workflow from earlier in the video. And you can see here that at the bottom of my actions palette, I've got a group of actions called basic workflow and there's two actions in there, basic workflow TIFF and basic workflow JPEG. Again, creating the TIFF and then creating the JPEG. And if you expand these, you can see what's basically built into each of these actions. These are the steps I recorded. This is the workflow basically set the background. That was when I took the uh, background layer, when you open the image and made it a regular layer. That's this right there, top layer, mode normal. Then we duplicated the layer, remember? And then we made, added the adjustment layer. We can open that up. There's the levels layer that we added. And then we merged the visible and then we saved it. So there it is, it's just that order of the workflow that we did. We can do, we can look at the same thing under the JPEG workflow. We flatten the image, we convert the profile, right? We converted the mode, we changed the size, and then we brought it into Topaz Photo AI. Now you could use Sharpen Photo AI, whatever you invoke to work on your image at this point is what will go into the recorded action. Uh, Topaz Photo AI, whatever you want to use at this point, whatever program, app, or whatever you want to use at this point, or you do use at this point in recording your action, that's what will be inserted here. And then, of course, we go on to save the uh, image as the JPEG. So there you go. So let's go ahead and record this. And I'm not going to go through both the workflows here, the, the TIFF and the JPEG, but I'm going to give you, I'm going to do one of them so that way you can see the general process of recording uh, an action. So if you go up here and you say new set, if you would pick that, that gives you the file folders here, like basic workflow. If you want to put a new action in, or record a new action underneath basic workflow, you click on basic workflow, you go up here and you click new action. So that's what we want to do. So we click new action. I'll bring open, over the dialog box that opens up and it basically gives you the, the place that you can name the action. So let's call it basic workflow TIFF 2, second version of it. It's going to be in the set basic workflow no function keys. You can do a function key here. You can add colors here if you want. I don't do any of that. I don't have enough actions to worry about that kind of stuff. So from here, when we press record, every 
step that we make in processing our image from this point will be recorded. So here we go, record. And now down here you'll see that the red record button is on. It's only going to it's not recording a bunch of stuff right now. It's only going to going to record the actions that we do, the stuff that we do to post-process our image from this point on. So what do we do when we're doing the TIFF workflow? The next thing we did, let's move this action palette off of here. And let's bring the layers palette over. We're going to go ahead and we're going to make the background layer when we brought the image in when we opened it to a regular layer we're going to go ahead and copy that layer then we're going to go ahead and bring in let's bring over the adjustments and properties over here real quick put in that levels layer there's the properties let's check the white point and black point let's check the white point Looks like it's lighting up just at about 250. Let's leave it at 255. How about black point? Black point looks good at zero, just a few pixels lighting up. We're good there. All right, let's go ahead and move those off. And the next thing we'll do is we're gonna do the, if there's nothing else we wanna do here, which there isn't, we're gonna go ahead and do the stamp visible, control shift alt E, that puts that up there. So again, all of these things are being recorded in that action. We'll bring the actions palette over. You can see that it's been recording all these steps that we've been doing. And now we've got that. The next thing we're going to do is save it. File, save as. Brings up the folder. Click on that just to get some text up here so we don't have to type it all out. And what we call this, uh, Kingfisher, Juvenile Female, Leaving Water, Splash, Fish, something like that. Save it. Brings up the TIFF options. We leave those as defaults like we talked about before. Hit OK. And we have basically completed the TIFF version of the workflow that quickly. And it's recorded all of the those uh, steps. And now we just hit stop. There it is. All of the steps of that process of creating that TIFF file are now in this action. And you can replay them simply by highlighting the action and hitting the play button when you want to process that image you just opened in Photoshop coming over from Lightroom in this case. Now, I will say that there are some other things you can do here and you can see that in some of these let's go down to let's open up my old JPEG workflow here you can see that some of these boxes have some things in them over here you can turn that on and what that does is when it's running through the action when you hit that play button whenever it gets to a step in here with a box lit up it's gonna stop because this is just a dialogue box. It's going to say, oh, I need to stop here and bring up the dialog box associated with this step, in this case image size, and give Ron the chance to make some alterations to the parameters of this, the image size in this case, and then move on to the next step once he hits OK. So if you ever want the action to stop and give you a chance to change some things, which you will want to do at times, you just click and fill in the box over here with that. Now you can do that down below sometimes in some of these other parameters even but for the most part it's in the major action that it's doing at the time so that's basically recording an action like I said earlier it's just when you hit this record button down here it's just going to start recording all of the things you do in Photoshop from that point on that'll record them and then you hit stop when you're ready to stop recording and you've got your action that's it it's as simple as that of course there's always more to things than we do here 
This is a very basic look at my workflow and how quickly you can actually go through and edit an image. Uh, you know, that's kind of that was the purpose of, of this video. So what we can do now is let's finish this off by I'll do an image coming out of Lightroom just using the actions. Okay, so one last thing here. We're going to process one last uh, Kingfisher image, and we're just going to do it using the actions. So the first thing we're going to do is we want to create the TIFF file, the TIFF version of the image. We're going to click on the basic workflow TIFF, and we're going to hit play. And what that did was go and open up the take us down to where we're going to add that levels layer. Let's bring over layers here so you can see what happened there. So what it did so far in that action is it created that um, regular layer out of the background and then it put the uh, copy there and it brought up where I want to add that adjustment levels layer and I had the box checked there so it's given me a chance to name it if I want to but I'm not going to here I'm just gonna hit OK so then what it did is it put that levels layer in you can see right here it put it in and now it brought up the levels properties so I can check the white and black points I'm just gonna hit OK for and now it's going to the save part it takes us into the belted kingfishers I can save click on that save it real quick say female flying up to perch and hit save okay so now we've got the tiff version once we hit the okay there and so then to follow on and do the jpeg part of it you would just click here and click play and go through uh, it'll go through the, the actions, uh, the steps, just like you recorded them. Bring up any dialog boxes that you indicated you wanted to be brought up. And you just hit OK and make changes and basically save the, save the JPEG version. So you can see how much quicker the actions can be in doing repetitive things to each one of your images. That's really it. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any questions, please put them in the uh, comments section down below. I'll try to get to them when I can, as quickly as I can, to uh, answer any questions you have. Until next time, have great light, take great images, be safe out there. I'll see you soon.